check. Check, check. There we go. Beautiful. Oh, my goodness. Hey, welcome to the Zeller Studio. I'm Dan, the uh, vice president of the Minnesota Watercolor Society. And uh, uh, first of all, huge welcome to Catherine Herding, who's going to be giving us our wonderful demonstration tonight. Oh, my goodness. Fantastic. Do we have any uh, new members here tonight or people who are first timers? Can we stand up really quick? Sorry not to put you on the spot, but it's going to take pressure off of me. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Okay, um, so I, uh, Vice President of the Minnesota Watercolor Society, and I have to do a, a, just a very brief announcement here. Uh, we are a volunteer organization, and this upcoming year we're going to be looking to fill six positions out of, is, we have about 15 board members and we need to fill about six positions. We're gonna send an email out with all the particulars, so I'm not gonna go into it right now. You're not gonna remember anyway. But we are a volunteer organization and we do depend on volunteers in order to function. No volunteers, no watercolor society. So if you're interested, in, please reach out to any of the board members here um, or, uh, you know, whomever and we will set you up with the information that you need. The last piece of information I have to give is that this restroom here is gonna be off limits due to all the hullabaloo up here. So there are two in the back and if you uh, have an issue finding them, we will get you there. So there we go. Otherwise, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Andy and Britt here or... Oh, there we go, Andy. <laughs> Catherine, you're going to have to get up here with the microphone next. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everybody. Glad you're here. Glad you made it. It's going to be a great evening. I'm going to introduce Catherine. I don't want to stand in front of her here. Um, is this on? Okay. I'll give you a little spiel here. Catherine has more than 45 years of experience as a painter in watercolors. She earned her bachelor's degree in zoology and botany from the University of Montana. Um, Catherine also designed and marketed a line of watercolor note cards when she was early into watercolor painting. And then her, shi her focus shift to painting the landscape and she began exp exhibiting her paintings locally. In 2006, she entered her first work in a national exhibition. So she's been around teaching us a long time. <laughs> but we appreciate that. Catherine is a past president of the Watercolor Society here, and she's also holding signature status in many watercolor societies, including American Watercolor Society, Transparent Watercolor Society of America, Watercolor USA Honor Society, and Louisiana, Missouri, Minnesota, and Red River, Red River Watercolor Societies. Um, <laughs> She's um, also been in some magazines, Splash 14, Splash 16, Splash 24. And right now, she is featured in a several page spread in International Artist Magazine. Um, you can look at it online and, uh, or, and order it online. I went to Barnes & Noble, but I didn't see it there. But I didn't look forever. Yes, and they're not that expensive. No, they're not. No. Um, they'll be online through November. What's the name of the magazine? International Artist. International Artist. Um, so where is Catherine teaching now? Where can you go to learn from her? She's up at the White Bear Center for the Arts, October through December. She will be at the Minnesota Landscape Ar Arboretum on December 12th and teaching freezing watercolors and other creative textures in watercolor. She's also uh, gonna be at the Minnesota Arboretum in June of 2025 with a plein air, and I've already signed up for that one. Um, she also teaches private lessons in her studio. So here you go, and Catherine, it's up to you now. Take over.
Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. Now we can get started. Um, glad to see so many. Uh, that went off. Is that? It's on? Okay. Okay, I got it. Glad to see so many fam familiar faces and a few that I don't know, but um, nice turnout. I appreciate your coming out on a night like this. So um, my idea for this workshop, this uh, demo was to um, see how we can elevate our paintings to the next level. Uh, we know that vi uh, value is probably the most important concept in um, painting, but it's only one of a one of three big uh, ideas that we need to base our paintings on. So what I wanted to do to, tonight is to talk about the three tools in watercolor that we can use to really create uh, more beautiful more beautiful work and more expressive work. So the three, uh, three ideas being value, which is the lightness or darkness of a, a color. And uh, it's defined by your value strip into seven or eight, nine, ten, how many ever uh, different values uh, of the lightness or darkness of a color. Second one is uh, color intensity, which is the brightness or dullness of a color. Uh, and the third one is uh, color temperature, which is, of course, warm or cool in terms of, of colors. And so by using all three of those together, we can create and enhance uh, the mood of a painting and uh, make it more, uh, uh, more beautiful. So value being our strongest uh, characteristic, most of you have worked with values and done value studies and done all the, all the requisite stuff for that. So I'm not going to uh, get involved in that too much tonight. Uh, though I did do a, a value study of my piece here that I was going to demo on. Black and white, three values, understanding where the big shapes are and where, um, where I want my brights. Uh, so black and white um, takes out the, the other characteristics of color. But the thing about value is that light, color, light values move forward in space and dark values move back in space, creating that depth in the, in the painting. So the second one uh, being temperature, warm temperatures move forward towards us, cool temperatures move backwards. And so we can use that combined with value to uh, create more depth, uh, even more depth in the, in the painting. And finally, intensity is the brightness or dullness of the color. So a real bright color being one or two um, colors only on, from the color wheel. So anything that is across the color, from, color wheel from each other has uh, at least three different colors in it. So a, a, a violet and a yellow. Violet is red and blue. Yellow is one color, it's pure hue. And you mix them together, you got three, three colors in them, and it's a neutral color. And so all those colors come inside the, the uh, wheel. So high intensity colors, the pure hues come forward, the low intensity colors move back. Mm -hmm. So if you want to separate things out, we put all those, those three things together, and uh, we can uh, maneuver and create a foreground, middle ground, background. And that's what we're after, is creating that space in the painting. We're asked as artists to create a, a three-dimensional thing on a painting on two dimensions. And uh, it's a little bit of a magic trick, but those, uh, those three concepts are what will, will help you out. So let's take a look at the palette and uh, uh, the one way I have managed my palette is by simplifying it. A lot of us start with 24 colors and add, add more in the boxes and we have, <laughs> we go down to wet paint and pick up a few more and we have a bundle by the time we're through. You really don't need all that many. Uh, 
the manufacturers have, have figured out how to uh, tempt us with names and uh, beautiful colors and uh, it's fun, always fun to get new colors and sparkly colors and whatever kind of colors. But uh, basic palette is, um, is all you need. I have about uh, 14 uh, colors on my palette, if that, right now. Four, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, yeah. Um, and I can do just about anything with those. Uh, but I usually choose from three to six colors only, which keeps my, my colors more brilliant. Uh, we're not mixing a lot of neutrals out of those, but we will mix neutrals, but unintentional neutrals because you have two colors, two pigments in one and then two pigments in another color and you mix those and you've got a lot of, a lot of stuff going on. So I suggest simplification by choosing, a, uh, say, a triad of colors and working with that. Or six is about my maximum. I usually don't use too many, but I, I choose that from what I've got on my palette here. And every once in a while I choose it, I add a different color, take off another color and, and play with that. But by simplifying the palette down to a basic uh, basic palette and then choosing a few for each painting, uh, I keep my colors uh, more brilliant. So a uh, limited, uh, limited palette increases the cohesive color structure and just creates uh, color harmony that um, works to enhance your painting. So if you uh, as an exercise or as a way to, to understand this, uh, you can try painting uh, using your local colors. So this one was, was uh, done with a triad of colors, uh, blue and a yellow, pure hues, and then a burnt sienna. So it was Windsor blue, burnt sienna, and Oriolan. And basically uh, creating the, the colors that you're, you're perceiving from the, uh, from the palette. So the trees are green, uh, shadows blue violet, and grass is light greens, sky is blue. So you know, your basic, uh, basic landscape. However, you can change this up and create some really interesting stuff um, by changing your, your color palette and which colors you choose. Here's the same, uh, same scene done in a different uh, triad. This is a secondary triad of, of green, orange, and violet, and um, much cooler looking because we're using a, a cool uh, pure hue green along with violets, which are both uh, cool colors. Adding the orange as an accent color to give us um, that color, uh, the color temperature contrast that that uh, is going to create interest and. Uh, animation in your in your painting, so that one is uh, very different in emotional connection to the viewer because of the the temperatures, and because uh, we have have some really interesting contrasts. The orange and the violet work well together. The green and the orange and the green and the violets, so they all work well together. So by choosing a uh, color scheme, a structured color scheme, we're, we're able to put some colors together that work, uh, work nicely. We can do it with another set of colors. This is uh, a tertiary triad. So we have Quin Gold, Permanent Magenta, and Thalo Turquoise. And I love this one. I use this actually quite a lot in my painting as a, a triad. Because of the jewel tones it gives you, there some really beautiful blue violets. Red violets, uh, orangey, neutral colors, and uh, it can be a very exciting palette to work with. Uh, this one is done with uh, the green being the dominant color, uh, the orange, yellow oranges being a subordinate color, and accent with the with the permanent magenta. Pardon me, question. So Quin Gold, Permanent Magenta, and Thalo Turquoise. On the flip side, we can use that same 
tertiary triad and change it up a little bit as well. So this one is done, same colors, but I've changed the dominance of the color by choosing orange as my dominant color, violet, red, violet, or blue, it's kind of a red, violet as my subordinate color, and the turquoise as a accent color, we get a totally different feel to the painting. It's uh, got a uh, much warmer tones to it. This one's kind of cool with the blue, blue greens. And uh, th with the, the yellow sky, both of them have yellow skies, but uh, this one appears to be a little bit warmer. So using the same, same colors, we can come out with different um, uh, different temp color temperatures, and uh, it's kind of fun to play with it this way because it gives you a, kind of a, uh, an insight into how you can manipulate color. And you combine, com compare that to this one up here, which looks really cool under the lights here. Uh, these look much warmer, and that's our local color one, which, you know, it's not bad, but it's not exciting. And so we're talking about, you know, how do we elevate our painting into something that people are going to really respond to? And color is a way to uh, generate an emotional response from your viewer. So that's, uh, that's one thing you can try. Just choose a, choose a um, triad of colors and see what you can do. You, basically, you're, um, you want to... Uh, start with one color that is your dominant color, choose a second one that is your subordinate color, and the third one which is going to be your accent color, and see what you can do to put that together. So kind of a fun, fun little project, uh, and it will, it will help you learn to manipulate your colors better and think in terms of how, what are we, um, what am I trying to create? Am I trying to create a, a warm sky or a cool sky or a warm tree or a cool tree? Um, it's going to help you uh, move into a, a different range of, of work. Uh, and I think it will help uh, elevate your color, um, color usage. So, all right. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, besides you know, playing with color, is uh, understanding how to um, how to create your your uh, composition. So thinking in terms of uh, what your your uh, subject is going to be and how you want to present it. Um, what about the subject attracts you? Being able to define what your subject is about is uh, important. Um, be specific about it. Don't say it's a pretty scene, it's uh, something I've always wanted to paint or, or whatever. Uh, think about it in terms of color. Is it, there something about the color that is attracting you? Is there uh, a line that is uh, attractive to you? Uh, values, being able to deter, uh, to state what you're talking about is kind of the first step into being able to, con to uh, give that away to other people and have them understand it. So uh, be specific about your subject. Use the elements of design to organize your composition and build a stronger painting. So I don't know, um, I think did you send these out to? Oh, okay, so you, you got you got those in your emails. Uh, so these are the common design formats that we use. There are probably other ones too, but these are, are pretty standard. Uh, S-shaped, I use that a lot. Verticals, yeah, we use that. Diagonals, I use uh, horizontals for water. We have grids, cruciform, uh, O-shapes, radiating L-shape. If you take a look up at the paintings I have on the easels, on the side over here. Um, the first one with the snow is a radiating. So the, the, the oak tree is in the center and we have the shadows radiating out from that one. The water one is uh, basically uh, my diagonal. So you're coming in at the right lower right corner where the, the color is a little different. We're zipping over to the raft 
and then we do a diagonal over to the, the small trees on the shoreline and we move up the, the cliffs on that one. And so your goal is to invite your viewer into your painting, have them travel through the painting and view the whole thing. If you have designed your composition so that uh, everything's on the left side and it feels a little side heavy, uh, probably not a successful composition because we're gonna have a lot of unused uh, space on one side that um, the viewer is not gonna be getting to. So your, your goal as an artist is to draw them through the painting and let every, people see the entire composition uh, and it should, uh, you know, should all work together. So uh, the design formats are kind of important. So when you're, you're working with your value scale or your, your value study, uh, think about how you might want to place some things to make it, uh, to make it better. Uh, decide which of your common design formats fits your subject and your concept uh, that you want to paint. Uh, also using directional line uh, where you, a line draws you into the painting. That's what happened on the, the snow painting over there. You have those shadows that zip you right up to the, the oak tree and get you uh, involved in the, in the painting. So think about how you can, uh, line can, can help you enter the painting. On this one, the shadows come out. We can you know, catch a line along the shadow, it's build up into the, uh, the tree itself and uh, go sideways across uh, this way. So there are multiple ways to uh, get the viewer m moving in it. And uh, that's going to uh, help create movement through the painting. The next uh, problem is to simplify your composition. Okay, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of students who ask me, well, where do you get these beautiful photographs, these fantastic photographs? And I said, there, there are none. Uh, my photographs are snapped just like everybody else's from a, an iPhone and I snap them when I'm a passenger in the car racing down the highway and I see something, oh that's good, I've gotten actually pretty good at uh, getting a, a decent photograph that way. Um, but the photographs don't come as uh, paintable uh, pictures, you have to manipulate them to, to move things, to um, <coughs> Uh, create the, the composition. What, you're, what you do when you're snapping pictures, you're taking a, a snapshot of something that you saw that, that had an interest. And so I will take the photograph and put it on the computer and take a look at it and crop it and see what I can find in there that uh, could make a, a great painting. A lot of times there's, there's nothing. Uh, it was just something that I saw that uh, captured my interest for a moment and if I have time and I'm out hiking and, and doing stuff where you're not going down the highway, uh, it's a little easier to analyze what you're, what you're thinking about when you, uh, when you see it. But the, sometimes I've done some paintings where they were just snapshots that attracted me and uh, so crop them down. So this is an example of uh, one of those Can everybody see that in the back? Okay. Uh, it's kind of far, far away, but um, this was the Mississippi River at Wabasha. And uh, I saw something in this that I really liked. And it really is about here. I don't like these, these trees coming in at the, the base. I don't need that. That's just very distracting. I don't usually like things cut off, trees half cut off on the edges of the paintings. It, it indicates there's something else going on outside the, the, the uh, confines of the painting. So we spend our time thinking about what's over here. Uh, what I really want you to do is to understand what's going on here. I really liked these, um, these branches on this tree, big old, probably cottonwood. Um, Shadows in there were nice dark shadows. There's water back in here that is uh, basically a, a bright white and uh, interesting tree formations. So I don't need all of this water in the front. There's no reason I have to paint that. There are a lot of times I say I really don't feel like painting it, so I won't. 
I'll crop it out. But uh, I, my uh, distance from the horizon to the top of the painting is um, a little bit bigger than what it is at the bottom, so it's not exactly in the middle. But if I cut it off about here, I, it tells the story well enough. I've got water in the front. And then I move into the painting in a zigzag, diagonal once again, to this tree back in the middle, middle ground. There also is uh, some background hills in here that are blues that I, I really liked. Hard to see on this photo because it's so tiny. But I've taken that whole picture and made it into something about that size. I don't need all this extraneous information. That's not important to me. So then I blow it up on the uh, copy machine. And I can actually see the branch work and the, um, the way that the, the branches are kind of hanging down. Uh, interesting lacy texture here. The blue, blue hills in the background, uh, the light on the water here, and then the blue gray, gray water in front. So changes my whole uh, outlook on that piece. Yeah, it's much more interesting. My focal point is right here. It's not right in the center of the page. Uh, so it gives us a little bit uh, more uh, balance on it. Uh, so we've got a two-thirds here, one-third here. So we're thinking in terms of how we, we cut the, uh, the horizon uh, vertically. So uh, changes changes the look a lot. Um, and there's a lot of stuff I don't have to worry about painting in here. So uh, there, there are certain things that just are, are complex enough that you don't really want to spend a lot of time trying to cre recreate that because you know they're not going to look right when you do it. Uh, They'll be overdone and uh, not uh, not believable. So um, try to really focus in on your on your subject and make sure that you can see and you can get the viewer moving through the painting. So here we come in along this leading edge here, and there's a, a turn in the the water here, and we catch it again. It goes back and forth, so zigzags up until we get up into uh, the tree area. Finally, we, we made it up there. So that's my uh, uh, subject for tonight as a, a demo. And it's going to be a quick demo. But oh, the other one I wanted to show you was, uh, was this one. So you don't have to paint everything you see. I have students who come to me and say it was in the photograph. So <laughs> you don't have to paint it. Uh, that happens more than you know. Um, so this is a photograph I took in Yellowstone. Uh, fly fisherman down here, which is really an interesting figure because it's lit from the left, uh, dark shadows on the right, and then he has his uh, uh, fishing line that is swirling across the river there. What I saw in this one, I like the figure, and it's kind of a, a triangular figure. It mimics this rock right here. I really like the juxtaposition of those two. But I'm looking at the figure and at the rock, and I'm not really seeing much of the rest of the, pa the painting. I, it doesn't get there. I've got trees over here. I've got uh, you know, some dead trees back here, more trees, uh, grasses. I don't need to paint that whole thing to get the idea across. Uh, I wanted to express. Um, interest in the in the water because uh, you know, it was running running pretty fast and the, the green color was really beautiful and that fishing line was catching the sun and uh, just shining so I did a, a some major surgery <laughs> and came up with that so we're the figure is mimicking this this large rock and they're actually um, juxtaposed across the stream. Uh, oh, the other thing, thing about this one is the, the fishing line is going this direction. So we really never, never look at this half of the painting or the photograph. 
So this one, the, the line is directed right into the middle of the, the background over here. So it actually gets us across the river. It doesn't give us a barrier we're working in, um, against because the line is delivering us over there. So it became a much more successful piece than, than trying to create that a lot faster to paint too. So uh, don't be afraid to crop. Sometimes you'll get more than one painting, uh, one idea in, from a painting. Uh, but do one at a time. Go back and do a second one uh, with a little bit different uh, idea to it. So, okay. So the other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, how do you capture light in a painting? In progress. And it's really a simple concept, um, but incredibly hard to do. Uh, light is, uh, can be different uh, temperatures. Here we're having uh, lights in the skies that are warm. We can have cool, cool clouds. Uh, but working with uh, the three, three areas we we have is value, temperature, and, con and uh, intensity. We can use those three tools. Uh, those are our, our, uh, in our, our toolbox, and they're the ones that are available for us to uh, create with. So value being the uh, contrast of uh, light against dark. So I have the, the light sky, the light um, water here, uh, darks on the trees. So we have uh, a, a good, uh, good contrast level. Make sure your shadows are strong enough to be in contrast to be believable. Cast shadows are about 40% darker th on, than the surface they're on. So if, uh, to get light to shine, you really need that uh, about three steps on your, your value scale. And students wonder why they can't, can't get that light. Well, we're working too light. Um, so if you have, bright white, you're going to have a middle value uh, for shadows. But if you're at a three on the surface, you're going to have closer to a six, possibly even a seven. So they, they need to be fairly dark. And it happens even with winter scenes, as in that picture. Uh, the lower part of the, the front is uh, quite dark blue. If we don't get those uh, darks deep enough in value, it uh, feels like it's a cloudy day. So we want to make sure that we get uh, a full, full spread of value on it. Uh, second is warm against cool contrast. This is one that my students uh, have a lot of trouble with, actually, understanding what's warm, what's cool. Your warms are going to be in the yellows to the, the reds. Cools are going to be the greens to the violets, basically. And so there's a balance. If you have everything cool, it feels really chilly. Think about the painting on the left here with the, the oak. I balanced it with uh, the oranges from the, the leaves against the, the cools of the, of the snow. So you're, you have this balance. You don't feel like you're, you're, you're off balance on it. Uh, I've had paintings I've done where it just uh, they turned out you know, technically good. Uh, except for the fact that uh, they felt off in temperature. And by adding a little bit of, of warmer color in shadows or somewhere in the, in the painting, I was able to uh, resurrect them and uh, make them useful paintings. Uh, but a lot of times a student will bring a, a picture up to me and, and what, what about it? I don't know what I don't like, uh, but I don't like it. <laughs> And if I go through the, my checklist, is it value, ten, temperature, or intensity? What, what is the one that's bothering me? And it could, it, a lot of times, it is the temperature contrast. Uh, greens tend to be mixed to cool. Uh, the greens need oranges in them to make them uh, really uh, natural looking, looking greens. And that orange warms them up. If, they're, if all the leaves on a plant are, are too cool or on the trees, um, leaves kind of a funny feeling. So make sure that you, you balance the color temperature. And then last of all is your bright against dull contrast. So 
uh, you have uh, uh, blues tend to capture people's attention, so I use that as a major component in a in a shadow. Think about uh, too many neutral grays can be boring. Uh, we tend to paint shadows that are gray, and they're not uh, not ex as exciting as they could be. So by adding, uh, by mixing color on the paper and letting uh, colors mix together, letting the watercolor do the work for you, a little bit of gravity, a little bit of watercolor, a couple different colors, you've got a mixture of warm and cool. So I usually, for a lot of shadows, use uh, cobalt blue and a, a mixture of brown matter with it. And uh, those two colors kind of separate out and they, they kind of float together and, and create the, the sense of, uh, of warm, cool. Those, that uh, warm pool will also move the eye across the painting if, it, if you start with a cool and gradually move it uh, to a warm across the page. That's going to draw the viewer uh, across your painting as well. So uh, that's uh, something to think about. The same with a value. If you grade a wash from dark to light, that's also going to be a, a move. Uh, move for the uh, painter so it, it gets the eye going and you and you move across the page so think about uh, neutral grays uh, keeping out of shadows but find a, a pair of complements so a blue and an orange are complementary uh, so find a, a chromatic gray across the color wheel somewhere in here there's a wide range of color between blue and orange all your burns, umbers, your burnt siennas, your yellow grays. This is where the neutral, the pure neutrals are in the middle, and uh, there's not a lot of color available. But as we move here, we move more towards the cool section. Over this direction, we move more towards the warm section. So uh, think about that as a uh, as a design area um, mixing on the paper. Uh, you'll have more interesting shadows and you'll get a boost from the color temperature contrast as well. So you, uh, by doing and bright against dull, you, you've created another, another way to ca uh, create uh, color. Uh, okay, make sure your shadows are translucent. You don't want uh, opaque shadows. Uh, a shadow is basically kind of like a, a veil laid over an object, and uh, it should be very uh, transparent. Think about your edges as you work, soften some or lose some of the hard edges. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, think once again about choosing a color scheme and use a limited palette. Um, so, don't be afraid to edit, exaggerate things. Uh, it's late legal, you can do it. Uh, we don't have to be uh, tied down by what we see on the photograph. It's, it's really more about how you're, you are feeling about the painting and, uh, and the colors and how you wanna express yourself on it. So with that, uh, I wanted to show you how I would at least get started on this one. Um, I chose, uh, first of all, I chose my, my colors and I decided on my tertiary triad, so that was going to be a blue-green, uh, turquoise, it's a beautiful color. It mixes really nicely with some of these other colors. So that's my dark. It makes uh, beautiful dark violets. This is uh, Quinn Gold. And um, the third one is going to be Perna Magenta. And it seems like kind of an odd little color scheme, but. Uh, the colors are beautiful, they're jewel tones, and uh, they make incredible darks. Uh, so I did the, my background, my sky, and my, um, my water to save some time so I can get right into the, the meat of it. I want, uh, I want some strong darks in here. 
Let's see, where's my, so you can see it. Nope. So you can see the, the dark area in here that uh, defines the tree in front of it. So darks move back, lights move forward. So I move this bush forward, push that tree back. And I'm going to use that concept all the way through here where you have lights against darks and uh, that helps to um, break up the, uh, the trees from one large uh, monolithic shape into uh, smaller versions. And also I want to get uh, this blue violet in here on the, on the uh, background trees. It showed up over here a little bit too. So I can start with that idea. So my violet is going to be the turquoise and the permanent magenta. And it's a strong color, so it's going to have a good value range. I'll put a little bit of color in here. Remember, I can edit. I don't have to do everything just as the photograph says. That could go better. Okay, so now I want to get my yellows in. For the lights in the in the tree, so this is Quinn Gold, and I may even make it into a fall scene. This is definitely a spring or summer. I'm putting well, yellow under all of it. Um, as my starting color because it's the lightest value and that's how I, I uh, capture that, that color. I'm going to leave a few sky holes in here. Okay, I kind of like, don't like the the top edge here, so I'm going to change that a little bit. That'll go up into a, it's kind of too uh, flat across the top. Okay, I need yellow over here. I want to keep the, uh, the water white back, uh, not quite there, it's, this is where it goes to. Okay, now while I have uh, wet paint on there, I can uh, make some greens. But you're going to say, well, they're not the greens I want. When you're working with a different uh, palette, um, I'm not concerned here about, uh, this is not about this photograph. I'm working with uh, creative color as opposed to local color. And I'm putting it directly into the into the water uh, on the paper, putting it around behind these guys, creating smaller shapes out of bigger shapes. My light is coming from left side. There wasn't a lot of light available, so I make a a decision as to what uh, what my light's doing. Okay. Um, what if I add a little bit of permanent magenta into the green? I can't see it. That's better. 
I can find some darks that way. I want to be careful over here because I wanted a little bit more uh, frilly leaf texture. Now I've got merging going on here, which is what I want it to do. Okay. Um, I guess this is all going to be trees as well. And this is going to be trees here. So blocking in the first layer. Let's let that just dry out a little bit. Uh, I'll go find my grasses. Use a flat brush for this. Oh, I thought for, forgot about what I was doing. Uh, I was thinking of of putting in a uh, my dominant color is going to be green in this. Subordinate is yellow, and a little accent of red colors in here. So we could be just starting with the fall fall foliage. But um, okay. Getting some grass work in. Just block ins at this point. And at this point, it's not supposed to look good. <laughs> if it looks good, you're trying too hard. That's where rescue painting comes in. Is that flat brush kind of your go-to? Uh, I don't use flats very often, but for uh, grasses like this, it's kind of useful. I use a 12, um, 10, 12, 14, and 18, I think, are my favorite brush sizes. And then I use some really big ones sometimes. The bigger your brush is, uh, the better off you are, probably, if you can uh, learn to control it. Um, you don't have to go back to the well as often. And so, you have a little bit more uh, control over your your paints. Uh, timing on watercolor is important. It's a big deal. How long do you let it sit there before you can not touch it or touch it? Or it's uh, and that can't be taught. That's something you have to uh, find out for yourself because it really depends upon the humidity, where you are, how fast it's going to dry, how much water you had in it. OK, block in is almost done. I need a, another green over here. Might have covered up some water there. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, let's build that out a little bit. Those are going to be my entry lines, my lines of direction coming in over this direction. 
Um, I want to get to the meat of it, which is right in here. So I want to mix a really strong dark. That's going to start with the, the uh, blue-green and the uh, violet, or the red-violet. So the shadows can be really strong dark. I can create the edge of the trees with that. Is the blue green that you're referencing like a viridian? Or you no, it's uh, turquoise. Yeah, uh, I used to use a, a primary blue, um, blue green. That's why I keep calling it blue green, but they discontinued theirs. So it's a phthalo turquoise. Well, I have some um, juicy color there. I want to start with some of these branches. And if it's not going to move, I encourage it. That's a lot of water. We put a lot of water in the paint. And then we get rid of the water. So you need the water to get it there, but you can't leave it there because then it backwater, backwashes into your... So that's kind of the, the trick on it is to understand how much you need to have it move and then how much um, you have to get rid of. What I wanted to do here was develop kind of a, a pattern of... of branch work. I'm not sure that's right. With this much water, I can direct it with a palette knife. And you can see that there's a variation in, um, in color as it moves. So let's do a little smaller brush, wherever it went, there it is. You can also uh, hang on to your, your board, your paper, and tilt it. I have it raised a little bit so it's going to move away from me. This is where I want you to look. And I'm exaggerating the color so that you will look um, and see the shadow. I'm leaving those uh, sky holes so it create a little bit of interest in that um, section. This requires a tiny brush. Right now I'm not worried about the actual color of it. I kind of like what's going on. Um, Trying to get the, the feeling of those branches as they arch out over the water. And then we'll have some more branches. So I'm ex exaggerating that as well because I was interested in that and I want you to look at it. So don't be afraid to create something that pleases you, but that also might interest your, your viewer. I 
Okay, I have some edges that are starting to harden up there. So I need to try some more color. We're getting up to the top of the tree, which is going to have more light. So I want to keep that maybe a little bit lighter green. I want to merge it into that turquoise. We don't have turquoise trees here. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. We, we see um, we see objects and identify them by their shapes as opposed to colors. If you don't like the sky holes, you cover them up. Okay, um, what color do I want? Uh, I want some of the red. For some darks in here. I'm working on a partially dry here, uh, section of it, I'm getting some interesting edges as it dries. They're uh, oozles, backgrounds, whatever you want to call them, um, that most people reject. But for this, it works. And I do have to admit that uh, when I get into this, and I'm working with different colors that I've not, don't work with every day, I'm very tempted to go back to colors I'm familiar with. Like my Windsor Yellow, I know exactly what it'll do, and it'll do exactly what I want it to do. But I'm bound because I have chosen my colors. <laughs> I'll leave that. Uh, I like the combination of the blues and the violets in here and then moving into the, the oranges up there. Uh, I do have another bush down here, so I need to get some dark behind it. I've changed my shapes a little bit here. It's all right. And it works better without your glasses. It does. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having some issues with the eyes. My glasses don't don't work with them, don't work without them. So I think I need a new set. Okay, I took care of that light area there. I'm going to drop some darks below that. And let them float up. The dark up here. like some of those oranges in the middle. This is very, very wet. It really needs to dry right now. Um, while it's still damp, I think I'll throw in a little bit of salt, create some texture. I do sometimes. I've got it plugged in here, but um, right now I don't want to use it. Uh, I uh, like things to settle in first because you can start moving paint around if it's too wet. So this one needs to dry a little bit. Just wondering what, no, it's too wet for my palette knife too. So I'm going to move over to this guy. Uh, 
Um, same problem here. Okay. So we're going to have some darks. And to separate uh, different areas, different spaces and shapes, we're using negative painting. So those of you who have studied with me have heard about that. Painting behind the object rather than the object itself. A must for learning to paint with watercolor. Because basically our lightest value is yellow, a lot of yellow greens and yellow oranges, and we can't paint those over darker values, so we need to, uh, to get those lights in first. If you take a look at the um, painting on the easel, the the, the um, raft, uh, the trees up the hill side, that was the base color of the painting. And then I added darks into that um, to create the tree shapes, so painted around those tree shapes. Rather than trying to paint around, uh, you can't can't really paint around them effectively uh, and leave lots of whites in there and make it look right. So you have to uh, get a solid light value in first and then uh, create the trees out of that with the darks. It's actually a very elegant way to paint, uh, very efficient, and you need to learn it. Trying to let uh, colors blend, taking more turquoise, letting it move a little bit. That's the other thing you um, should learn is uh, you know, what your paints are doing. Some some of the paints just sit and don't do anything. Why don't you put them on? But other ones uh, move and work. My reference, my Windsor Yellow, that's a one that moves into a, a, uh, a wet wash and creates a, a yellow uh, kind of uh, hazy shape in there. Uh, great for creating backgrounds. These guys don't move as much, not quite as energetic. Oh, I was going to do a red tree in there. Okay, you can do that. Magenta. It's kind of a dull red. But I'm going to add some of the yellow to it. Create some oranges. This is going to be my accent color. I want it to blend into that green there that's wet. You can add some more oranges up here, so we're going to have color changing. Okay, let's let those guys up a little bit more color back here. I'm torn. What color that should be. Okay, then um, I'll let those guys sit for a while. And I'm gonna, I'll show you what I do with the grasses. You want to dark at the base. <coughs> Still working with my green as my main dominant color. 
the yellow orange as my secondary and this red as an uh, accent color. Okay, get a little bit of texture going. Fill in some of the whites. Uh, now I'm going to have some uh, Blue grays. Do you find yourself working back into the distance as your brush is forming? I'm not sure. What was? Repeat that. I, I was thinking when you're in the foreground, you have a lot of pigment on your brush. Yeah. As that dissipates, do you carry it back? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you're, you're referring to something in here that, that you need, you're running out of pigment? Yeah. 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 Like the same grasses would be background a little bit there'll be a little bit different color yeah different. going going back yeah yeah that's and it, it the colors really don't have to match necessarily but it should be a little bit uh, grayer I'm going to create a little bit of shadow or uh, reflection in here. Maybe. Need a brush. Softening up some of those edges. That one just kind of died there. Dried right in the middle. do with the water here, a little bit of reflection. It's too wet yet. Okay, I'm waiting. Fly fisherman and the his the yep. line. Mm -hmm. did you use masking fluid. Or did I did. You use, yeah, okay. I used masking fluid for it. Yeah. Yep. That one was kind of too tiny to. I just wondered if you used that palette knife trick. Um, nope. That one. It's too hard to get the the curvature on that with the knife. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, it was tricky uh, trying to get, you had, I had to get a nib that was pretty new that uh, could do a fine line. You can change the pressure on it to uh, create a heavier fine line, but got to be careful with that one. Okay. Uh, It's colorful, if nothing else. <laughs> I use the side of the rigger to create my cattails. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, now the greens are drying over here. I can get in a little bit of branch work. some sky holes we can work against. Now I need to make it uh, a little stronger dark right through here. Soften up some edges. Okay, I'm busy thinking about how I can make it work. Turned off the, sh the sound. So what I'm looking for right now are changes in values. I can drop in some stronger colors where it's still wet. break up this shape. It's too monolithic. <laughs> Don't want to lose that orange. I want a little bit of that showing. Let's leave those and let them dry a little bit. Uh, the other thing I was going to do was 
little bit of reflection underneath the wall. The grasses. Well, that's pretty wet. All right. Um, so these I want to just drop in and let them float downwards. Put it at the base of the grass. Tip it. Let it go downhill. <coughs> yeah. Yes. Um, good question. I'd use um, Winsor Newtons and uh, Daniel Smith. Most of them, Winsor Newton, I use uh, Daniel Smith is a transparent pyrrole orange. Uh, this is a whole vine, actually. Um, and this is a, a Sennelier, uh, the turquoise. Mm -hmm. So, but most of them are, are Winsor Newton with a couple of the Daniel Smith. Um, I have one, two, two opaque paints, and the rest of them are all transparent. So there's, um, there's a combination of, of pigments in here, but I, I've used Winsor Newton for many years, and I just I know how, what they do, and I, I kind of like them. So I do like Daniel Smith. Uh, Paints, they're very saturated. Uh, they're, they're good paint. Excuse me, question. How do you tell which paints are transparent? Is there something that you Nope. Uh, sometimes uh, the Daniel Smith, that they call it transparent pyrrole orange. Mm -hmm. And that one uh, is transparent. They also have a pyrrole orange, which is not transparent. Um, really simple. Draw. Uh, Take a, uh, a black magic marker, make a, a line there, and just take a, a brush load of color and with your flat brush and just brush over that line. You can see the opacity um, when it dries. It leaves a, a film on the surface, and so you can tell that way. Um, you can look online, probably. Uh, the manufacturers may tell you some, some of that. I don't know for sure, but I just, uh, just test it out on the paper, and you can you can kind of see ones that are are opaque um, when you're working with them. And I have this one for a specific reason. Uh, it's a permanent green light, but it uh, it looks opaque when it goes on, and it's really bright. Uh, but I use it with the permanent magenta to make a nice uh, olive green. So. Some of them may. I'm not sure which ones. Um, yeah, square. That little square, yeah, it has, line, right. Line yeah, you're right on that. Yeah, they started doing that, yeah. Also has whether it's transparent or okay, yeah, yeah, it's good to know, yeah. So it, um, yeah, you got to start through a, a whole lot of stuff to to get to where you want to be. But uh. okay, Andy, 
tell me uh, what's the time? How are we doing? Okay. I wonder about that. So I'll leave that as is. Um, any questions I can answer? Oh, so yeah, go ahead. In the tree, um, the left I see um, all the sky holes. That's from the salt you put in there. Right? There, yeah. There's some little marks in here. Yeah. The salt. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. I might get rid of a few of those just by working over them. Mm -hmm. um, I like to keep it to a minimum on on the salt, but. Uh, uh, I like this area better, so I'd probably maybe do a glaze over those. Yeah. So, other questions? Well, I encourage you to try um, something a little out of your comfort zone. It usually is for, for people who have not tried it. Uh, sometimes it's for me too. <laughs> but uh, it gives you a chance to to play with color, to understand um, how the colors mix together, what they're going to do when they hit the paper, but also gives you an idea of what you can do to create a little bit more excitement in the paintings. So, yeah. How do you know when you're done? <laughs> That's a good question. This time is up. Yeah, right. Yeah, I quit. <laughs> I'm done now. Um, when I get to a point where I, I start feeling like I'm picking at it, and thinking little diddly little things that I put it up in the studio and set it there for a few days, sometimes a month, two months, oh, wow. if it's a bad painting. Uh, <laughs> some of them just never are rescued, but um, uh, actually there's some of them that I had put in a bin and did not looked at for a while and I bring it back out and I'm like, that's not bad. <laughs> so I, I give it a little space, a little time so that uh, I can interact with it, and it, the painting talks to you. It, uh, uh, you'll see things that you don't see when you're working close up. And that's the other thing. I recommend um, maybe a 45 minute workout on, uh, at the easel, and then uh, put it up and look at it from a distance. Because they're, they're to be viewed from a distance rather than uh, nose to nose when we work on them. On the table, and you're sitting down. You're you're six inches from the, the painting. And you can't see it. Monet's don't look good at that that level. So it's a little bit of space, a little bit of distance helps. So any others? Okay. Well, enjoyed working with you guys. Uh, have fun with it. Yeah. Thank you. Have fun with the paintings, and um, there was some. I had some postcards back there with my contact information on them. Also, uh, if you you didn't get a, um, there's a. I have, I'm having an open studio uh, next week, Friday, Saturday. If you're interested, I had invite Sarah. If you don't, if there are none left, uh, give me an email. Shoot me an email. I'll I'll send one out to you. So. Because you're selling some of the paintings up there. I am. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So. David decided that we needed to clean out the studio. <laughs> <laughs> so.